the rev needle is pushing 7000 rpms as I grip the titanium gear knob and slam it down into fourth. The speedo needle creeps over 150 km per hour, while the engine again raises a ruckus racket as the end of the straight approaches. I'm in the 2018 Honda Civic Type R at Lausitzring in Germany, and I'm learning pretty rapidly that this car is a handful. The all-new, 10th generation hot hatch stays true to its Honda Civic Type R forebears with front drive underpinnings, foregoing the all-wheel drive many of its direct rivals are endowed with. We're talking Ford Focus RS, Volkswagen Golf R and perhaps even in the competitor set could be the Mercedes-AMG A45, because the Civic is built in Europe. Well, it's built in the UK, which is still part of Europe for now. But, I digress. The shift light on the dash flashes at me, and fourth gear becomes fifth as I cross the start-finish line, approaching 200 km per hour before pushing hard on the firm brake pedal and continuing out for the next lap. The braking performance is nothing short of incredible. Back to fourth gear, the new rev matching feature of the six-speed box blips the throttle for me and I feather the throttle through the first corner, before dropping back to third with the steering wheel tussling in my grip. It's an ultra-responsive steering rack, verging on twitchy in the racy plus R drive mode that also stiffens up the adaptive dampers and increases throttle response, not to mention loosening its noose on the traction control. I lift off the throttle as I sling through an off-camber corner, and the back end slips out and I steer it back into line, making use of its adjustability while wrestling some understeer, and then just a touch of torque steer under throttle. The nose tucks in nicely upon quick changes of direction, but I really need to keep my grip on the tiller in the longer sweeping bends because the front axle pushes against me, and the line I want to take. It's enjoyable, but I fear the Continental Sport Contact 6 tires won't withstand this pace and this severity for much longer at a track like this. The sharpest drive mode setting means I'm being yelled at rather than whispered to, as though the car is grabbing me by the scruff of the neck to make me pay attention to what's going on ahead of me. Part of the reason I've got to be so focused is that this Type R, of course, eschews the option of an automatic transmission, favoring the more hands-on approach of a six-speed manual, which has a terrific rev matching system that'll do the heel and toe dance for you. That manual shift action is a delight, typically Honda, and as I depress the robust clutch pedal and snatch the next gear there isn't much effort needed due to the short gates. And the engine? Wow! It stays true to the high revving nature of Honda models of years gone by, doing its best work from about 4000 RPMs onwards. With 228 kilowatts of power, for Australia. Markets with better fuel quality get 235 kilowatts, at 6500 RPMs and 400 Newton meters of torque from 2500 to 4500 RPMs, this is an engine that does its best work higher in the rev range. It has a mono scroll turbocharger that doesn't allow it the most linear power delivery down low in the rev range, but there's not much time being spent there at Lossett's ring, as third, fourth and fifth gears are the ones we're working with most. I pushed the Civic, accelerator pin to the floor in third gear and waiting for it to run out of pull. It screams, the three exhaust pipes at the back offering a chorus to my ears while the tires scrabble to keep their grip on the perfect surface below. The surprising bit is this track is too short to exploit the higher speed threshold of the driver train. But a quick stint on unrestricted Autobahn shows that the claimed top speed of 272 km per hour is realistic, if not quite achievable with trucks and Peugeot 206 wagons to contend with. For the record, it was 261 km per hour that flashed up, albeit momentarily, and apart from the bonnet seeming to disagree with the wind at that amount of speed. The extensive aero kit made it stick to the road like Chewy to a shoe. That's all well and good, 
but most of us don't drive on a racetrack or an autobahn to get to and from work, and that's where the second part of this review comes in. At lower speeds, driving between sets of traffic lights in German villages, there is some noticeable turbo lag, particularly in the most sedate drive mode, comfort. Still, the shift action is easy, and the ride comfort, even on 20-inch wheels with 245-30 profile Continentals, is better than acceptable over cobblestones and potholes. I look forward to seeing how it copes with roads outside Windsor on Sydney's fringe, because the back streets of Dresden didn't challenge it too much for a sporty hatchback. It can't match the AWD hatch brigade for traction, with some wheels spin when taking off from the lights in first, and even second gear. Honda has given the car some city smarts, with the brand's range of safety technology fitted as standard, but it's worth noting the Civic Type R won't get the same 5-star crash rating as the rest of the range, it will go unrated, and it only has 4 airbags, driver, passenger and full-length curtain, missing out on front-side airbags due to the sport seats. And those seats are spectacular. They are comfortable and well-cushioned, and like a mother's hug they squeeze enough, but not too much. The seats are manually adjustable up front, and the rear bench is a two-seat setup, not a three-seat layout. There are no rear vents, no rear power outlets, and no flip-down armrest, but the seats, which lack adjustable headrests too, are comfortable and supportive, and the space is great too. The boot is great for the class at 414 litres, easily enough for a set of spare wheels for any track days you plan to do if you put the back seats down. There's an inflation kit under the boot floor if you need it. So it's quite a handful on the track, and quite livable in normal driving. But at $50,990 plus on road costs it is on the expensive side of the equation, at least when you compare it to all-wheel drive rivals like the Focus RS. Sure, it's well equipped, and I, like many others, am really keen to see what the thing is like on Australian roads when it arrives in Australia in October. And yes, there's no denying it's an involving and fun thing to drive, but as slick as the shifts aren't as enticing as the whale from the engine bay is, I can't really see it being better in all disciplines than a Golf R or Focus RS. The post office is closed in Fleming, Saskatchewan, but no matter, the postmistress, Jean Green, is outside on the gravel road, looking at the open-top Mercedes-Benz with her two granddaughters. We think your car is just beautiful, she says. It does look sleek and impressive, if out of place among the dusty pickup trucks parked on Main Street. We don't often see cars like this here. Can we look in it? Of course they can, and her eldest granddaughter, 14-year-old Carries, ends up sitting behind the wheel, getting a back massage from the seat of the 170,000 Singapore dollars 550 cabriolet. Jean takes photos to send their dad while eddies of dust scuffle in the air. Is it always this windy? I ask, and she shakes her head. Oh no, not at all, she says. Sometimes it's windier. There's not much to shield the wind in Fleming, the first town west of the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border on the Trans-Canada Highway. I've been driving through the wind, off and on, since Halifax, on a frenetic road trip to visit 10 Albanian lakes of Canada's provincial capitals in conjunction with the country's 150th birthday. The first stop was St. John's, Newfoundland, but I only drove around the block before hurrying off to get screeched in. Just as well, there was snow in the air on the Victoria Day weekend and the top was down on the C-Class. All very symbolic, really. There aren't many convertibles in blustery Newfoundland, but if you want the roof off while driving on the rock, a Mercedes is a good choice. Every Canadian Benz Cabriolet includes heated seats, and from there, you can add all kinds of extra warmth, a heated steering wheel, and even heated armrests on the most expensive S-Class, 
air scarfs that blow hot air onto your neck from below the headrest and air caps that raise a flap above the windshield and a screen behind the seats to effectively block cold wind from the cabin. So why bother? Because opening the cabin to the sky opens your heart to the country, that's why. There's a lot of heart in Canada, and a road trip in a convertible is still one of the best ways to experience it. I flew west to Halifax and drove up in the sunshine to the Pictou Ferry, crossing to Prince Edward Island and Charlottetown. People didn't look at me so strangely now with the top down, but the $57,000 SLC 300 still attracted come from away attention. They looked at me especially strangely when I drove down a boat ramp to dig the tires in the ocean. More symbolism, especially since I was nose first. A similar stunt a few years ago taught me the hard way to not dunk the driving wheels into the slimy, slippery water. All good road trips should include a ferry, and the PEI ship to Wood Islands is officially a part of the Trans-Canada Highway. It drops tourists onto the south shore of the postcard Pretty Island, giving them an hour's drive up to Charlottetown or, turning right, 90 minutes to Anne of Green Gables and the best beaches. The province might be neat as a pin, but its potholes are memorable. I paused only for lunch in the capital, just long enough to see the birthplace of Confederation, 150 years ago. The 12.9-kilometer bridge over to New Brunswick is a stunning piece of engineering that drops westbound drivers in a marshy area scenic only for birdwatchers. The road onto Moncton seems just a passage between endless unremarkable trees, but a detour south to the Bay of Fundy makes up for everything. I swapped over to a more powerful AMG C43 for this drive, and the Benz ate the bends of the secondary highway, skimming past farms and patches of forest on its way to the coast. Farms, forest and the sea, could that be Canada? A flight to Ottawa followed, and then a drive in the larger and more expensive SL550 east to Quebec. I ignored the navigation system and stayed in Ontario beside the Ottawa River all the way to the bridge at Hawkesbury, which considers itself Canada's most bilingual town. The SL was pleasant enough to drive in the sun but was wasted on the highway, stuck in traffic near Montreal. I switched to a tiny smart Ford Hook Cabriolet, just a third of the price of the larger Mercedes, for the rest of the drive to Quebec City. Suddenly, the roads grew bumpier. Was it the smart's urban suspension, or just Quebec? I found a museum along the way dedicated to Gilles Villeneuve, Canada's Formula One hero and parked the funky little smart next to a mural of Villeneuve's Ferrari. Hey, they're both open to the wind. Then a pair of flights through Toronto to Winnipeg, to make this drive feasible in five days and skip the monotony of northwestern Ontario. It meant I missed the wonderful drive beside Lake Superior from Suez to Emory to Thunder Bay, but time was pressing. If you drive across Canada yourself, do not avoid this section. The road was built to attract tourists, and it's one of the finest drives in the world. And now here I am, in dusty Fleming, Sask, in the most expensive car yet, where the sky dominates everything and the people are as friendly and unassuming as anyone you'll ever meet. I sold some property and I could buy this car, says Jean Green to her granddaughters, teasing. I'd have to live in it, but do you think I should? Their eyes widen and she smiles even more broadly. The mid-time flight from Regina to Calgary drops me just an hour from the Rockies, and I drive west in an AMG SLC 43. The sky is very dark ahead, and I raise the top at last. It's a hard roof with a large piece of laminated glass to let the remaining light in, and the cabin is very quiet when it's in place. The clouds hurl rain to the ground, followed by sheets of hail and ice, and then blow away as if they'd never existed. I drop the top again in Canmore under the tall shadow of the Three Sisters and turn back from the mountains, hurrying past ranch lands and oil pumps to Edmonton. The big sky blackens and clears a few more times before reaching the airport, but the rain never lasts more than a few minutes before it disappears and the road is completely dry. A final flight sadly taking me right over the glory of the Rocky Mountains and down to the oasis of Vancouver, 
and then a drive in the most powerful bend of the trip over to Vancouver Island. The AMG C63S makes 505 horsepower, and like with the SL in Quebec, there's far too much traffic at this time of day to properly experience such a car. It's stop and go over the Malahid summit, but the car devours the twisting highway west to Silk. And before I really know it, I've dipped the tires in the Pacific, double back and now I'm in Victoria, parking beside mile zero of the Trans-Canada Highway. Did Canada prove itself to be farms, forest and sea, with some mountains thrown in for good measure? The geography is breathtaking for sure, especially seen without the filter of a roof or even a side window. But no, Canada is not geography. It's an experience and a sense of worth and pride, and a value that's no different in the ports of St. John's and Victoria than in the inland terminals of Winnipeg and Regina. And, dare I say it after a trip that stayed in the country's southern reaches, in the woods and on the tundra of the north. It's too ambitious to try to see Canada in a week, or even a month, but you've got to start somewhere. And if you do make the attempt by road, it's best to open yourself up to the country in a convertible, and the most comfortable one you can find. You never know what you'll see, and who you'll meet, along the way.